Welcome to the Unhurried Living Podcast. My name is Alan Fadling, and I invite you to listen to leadership conversations that will help you to develop healthy rhythms of rest and work and to live fuller in friendship with God. I hope this podcast will help you to overcome hurry and make time for what matters most. And now, enjoy today's episode. Hey, friends, welcome to episode 206 of the podcast. It's good to be back after our holiday break. My name's Alan, and I'm so glad you've joined me here. I'm hopeful that our time together will help you rediscover an unhurried way of life and leadership. Each week on the podcast, we have leadership conversations to help us lead better in the spirit of Jesus' unhurried way, the way of leadership that flows from a full soul instead of an empty one. Sometimes I'm talking with fellow authors, and sometimes I'm talking with leaders just like you who are learning to live and lead at the fruitful pace of grace and peace. Today's episode is on a theme that a lot of us work pretty hard to avoid. It's the theme of aging. We'd much rather talk about how to stay young than to address the realities of growing older. This year, I celebrated my 60th birthday. And it was the first decade birthday that has had a lingering impact on me. 30 and 40 and 50 came and went for the most part for me. But 60 has been a year of reflection and of many questions. So I'm glad to be talking today with Alice Freiling about her latest book, Aging Faithfully. I found her insights especially encouraging and hopeful, and I think you will too. Alice Freiling is a spiritual director and a best-selling author of 10 books on relationships and spiritual formation. Alice received training in spiritual direction from the Christos Center in Minneapolis and training in the Enneagram at Loyola University. She's been leading Enneagram workshops for 30 years, teaching participants how to use the Enneagram to know God and themselves more deeply. She and her husband, Bob, have two married daughters and four grandchildren. They live in Monument, Colorado. Now, if you're a new listener, welcome to the podcast. If you find these episodes helpful, would you please follow, rate, and review? And be sure to share this podcast with your friends. So now, let's dive into my conversation with Alice Freiling. On today's Unhurried Living podcast, I'm pleased to have Alice Freiling, author of Aging Faithfully. Thank you, Alice, for joining me for this conversation. It's very good to be here. Well, I, I've been looking forward to the conversation. I really enjoyed reading your book. And I always love to start a conversation about a book by asking the author if you could share a little bit of the story of how this particular book came to be. That is one of my favorite questions. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> Writing this book has been, um, well, in this category of my life, definitely the most life-giving experience I've had. It was just amazing. Um, I went into it somewhat reluctantly. But the, the first inklings, looking back, the first inklings of the book were in, when I got into my late 50s and I realized 60 was looming ahead. And I thought... I need to prepare for this. I mean, when I had children, I went to the library and bought on the stack of books I could hardly carry to find out how to be a parent. And I had a sense that when God allows us to get older, it's with purpose. And so there is a purpose to this season of life. And for me, that was a purpose very much related to my spiritual journey. And I thought, I, you know, I've never been here before. I need help with this. And so I started looking for books. Mm. Um, and I actually, you know, I found a lot of good books, but most of them were about retirement, the logistics of retirement, okay. and financial planning, and how to get older without looking old. Um, and, you know, <laughs> and they, you know, and a lot of wonderful memoirs. So, you know, there are a lot of good books out there, but I was looking for the one that really, um, helped me think about how will aging or is aging changing things in my soul. So that was in my late fifties. Mm. 
And then when I, I'm 77 now, mm. and when I turned 75, I started thinking, you know, I just haven't found the book yet. Hmm. And I had a friend who was telling me I should write the book. And I said, I, you know, I'm not going to write another book. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, then one morning when I was musing on this, I realized that, actually, I think under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I realized that I already knew everything that I needed to know, partly because of all the history, you know, I'd become a Christian in high school and I had all those years of discipleship, walking with God, learning to know God. And my sense that morning was um, just a nudging of the Holy Spirit. It's like, Alice, just write the book. <laughs> and so I pulled out a piece of paper and I started writing and outlining the book. And I could tell this is what I really wanted to do. Um, and interestingly, I told my daughter about that the day that I was thinking about it. And I said, I can't believe I'm thinking of writing a book for a dying <laughs> audience. But it's not that oh, our no. demographic is the fastest growing demographic. I think it's, I think it's the fastest or one of the fastest growing demographics in our society. Yeah. And I found that it's really, um, well, the way I say it, it's really scratching an itch that people are looking for this. And my experience is just one experience. Everyone has their own experience, but it's been so life-giving mm. um, to me to write it. I'll just tell you one more thing. Yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> writing, writing the book was a little bit like meeting with a spiritual director. And it was, I think it's because the other books I've written were written after the fact. And this one was in the midst of my experience. Yeah. And I had the sense that the book was saying back to me, um, well, uh, you know, that's a good point, but I think you need to maybe say that a little bit better or, or think, uh, think about that a little bit more. And sometimes I would have a sense that the book was saying to me, you know, you don't really believe that. And so I had to think about that one some more too. Wow. Um, so it was, it was very interactive for me, um, yeah. both well, with I, the book and with the spirit. Yes. That's so good. I love when a book grows out of lived experience. That's very present, obviously telling stories that have already happened is, is beautiful and good, but there's something kind of alive. I think about a book that grows out of lived experience in the midst. So as you've written this book, aging faithfully, it won't come as any surprise to our listening audience that we're a culture that's not obsessed with, you know, uh, being elders, but trying to be young or at least look right. like it. We spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort trying to at least look young. But what you've written about really is the gifts of aging. And, and I really think our culture needs to hear what those sorts of gifts might be. I That's that's so important to me. I mean, it's important to me in my own life. And that was important to me to write about that. The subtitle of the book is The Holy Invitation of Growing Older. Mm. And I can't take credit for that. The folks at NAV Press came up with it. Oh, they're always um, good. Yeah, they were good. Um, but I, 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 I'm caught by Jesus' comment in the first beatitude that's in Luke 6, as opposed to, you know, we're used to the list in Matthew 5, but this is in Luke 6. Yeah. And translated in the message, Jesus said, um, let me see if I can get this right. You are blessed when you've lost it all. The kingdom of God is there for the finding. Hmm. And the day I read that, I was a little discouraged about um, getting older. I mean, as you know, authors don't live happily ever after, <laughs> and we're writing what we need to hear. So yeah, that's right. I was, I was pretty discouraged, and I thought, this is amazing. Um, everything I'm losing is uncovering more of the kingdom of God for me. Mm. So I, that actually, that quote isn't even in the book, but I would say that would be a theme of the book now with hindsight. Yeah, that's so good. Well, I, I, again, you know, we're a culture obsessed with, uh, you know, youth is wonderful for young right. people, right? <laughs> right. But trying to be, uh, trying to pretend that you're 20 or 30 when you're 50 or 60 may not be your best move. Uh, you talk about how 
just practically speaking, how with retirement can come a decrease in productivity. Obviously, retirement often means a change in job status, sort of by definition. But you also talk about how retirement could be an opportunity for fruitfulness, increased fruitfulness. So that productivity, fruitfulness contrast. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it's playing with words a little bit, but there, that's yeah. what I like to do. There are, there are words that describe for me what happens. As we get older, um, we have less opportunity to be productive in a familiar way. And, and being productive as a younger person, it's, it's really a good thing. I mean, that keeps our world turning. So that's a good thing. Absolutely. My issues, as I look back on my life, wasn't, it's not that I was productive productive, because that I'm happy about. But I was driven to be productive. Ah. And a lot of people, I'm surprised a lot of people think the word driven is a compliment, but it wasn't a compliment for me because I I was compulsively task oriented. Mm. And that's now that's how I would probably describe my version of productivity. And then as we get older, Well, first of all, we don't have the opportunity for productivity if we retire. I mean, when Bob retired, that was a time of grieving for him, even though he chose it and he's happy that he did. But it is a time of grieving. For me, um, the other issue with productivity is I just don't have the energy to be as productive as I used to be. Mm. Um, So, you know, I, I look at that and I think, well, this is not a good thing about getting older. But it is because now that I can't be as productive, I find myself focusing more on the fruits of the spirit, Mm. Um, love, joy, peace, patience, all the things in Galatians 5. And when I focus on that, um, I'm actually spiritually, I'm more productive than I used to be Wow! to be able to sit and listen to my granddaughter or. just well before before the podcast start started, I was just sitting and listening to music. Mm. And in the olden days, I would have been hustling, looking over my notes to make sure I didn't forget anything. And so I can focus on. For me, I was thinking, okay, so what fruit of the spirit am I focusing on, or am I experiencing? And it was peace. Mm. And I thought, this is, you know, this is worth the loss, worth worth the many losses. Um, yeah. And it doesn't mean that does, every day is a new day, and I am not a I'm not a Pollyanna person. Mm. So um, I'm not saying that it's all fun, but it's worth it. Yeah. So the fruits of the spirit are are one way that you have seen this fruitfulness, you know, um, become a focus increase. I wonder too about you talked about that tendency you had about task orientation. Mm-hmm. I wonder what you've seen in terms of fruitfulness in, you know, interaction with people, uh, relationality, th- those sorts of fruitful uh, experiences. What have you noticed there? One of the things I've noticed um, a lot, as I look back on my life, I realized that I was believing a lot of misconceptions and I'd even say lies now, the lies of the, um, you know, Satan, when he lies, he speaks his native language. Yeah. And so I, I think about what I'm not doing and what I am doing. And I've gone back to the verse in Ephesians 2 that we were created by God for good works that he created ahead of time for us to do. Yes. And I can remember looking at that verse in my 40s and 50s and thinking about it in light of my agenda for the day. And I had a sense I honestly think I do th- thought think I did think this, but I probably didn't notice it. That well, yes, God has created me for good works, but I think He forgot all of these things today. <laughs> so now it's all up to me. <laughs> and now I well, what I talk about in the book, and I've lived with this fruit now for a few years. Um, the discipline of irresponsibility, mm. um, because I am a compulsively responsible person what my husband needs what my family needs what god needs that's a problem to put it like that but what god needs um international needs i worry about things and i think if i worry about them then i'm being responsible yes Uh, so i 
it really was the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I thought one day, you know, I need to practice the discipline of your responsibility. Yeah. So what that means is if my family or my church, the pandemic helped a lot because my, I didn't have as many demands on my responsibility. I know. So I, you know, I had to say that that kind of eased off a little bit. But when I, well, even yesterday, I got a request for something and I, I thought, oh, I just don't know if I can do this. And so practicing the discipline of irresponsibility, I said, I have to get back to you on that. Mm. And sometimes when it's my family, it's really hard to say that to my family. But if I do, I end up lying on the sofa reading a book and it pushes the boundaries of how much I can handle because the book I'm reading isn't even a Christian book. It's a novel. <laughs> I'm lying on the sofa. But I can I can usually tell when my over my compulsive responsibility has kind of drained off and my energy has returned. So then I go in and the way, whatever way I'm productive comes from a place of love. And it doesn't come from, I'm not saying it doesn't come from my ego, but yeah, not quite as much so. No, that makes sense. I, I was really drawn to that, that phrase, that uh, compulsive responsibility. I identified with it myself. And I think as I talk with a lot of ministry leaders, I think many of us who care for people and who are in leadership roles in nonprofits or churches or whatever, mm -hmm. I think compulsive responsibility is a really familiar dynamic. You know, I was thinking about your ministry of unhurried living when yeah. anticipating being with you today. And um, the roots of all of this start when we're really young, for better and for worse. And I was thinking it's almost as though in this season of aging, it's a postgraduate research project <laughs> on unhurried living. It's a little beyond what we experienced before, but yeah. we've got to keep going with the research postgraduate level. That's, That's really a complimentary good. way of putting it. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I, I noticed, you know, I had my 60th birthday this year. It was the first decade birthday that sort of made an impression. Yes, it does. Yeah, 30, it? 40, 50 kind of came and went. That wasn't, didn't make too much of an impression, but 60 sort of did. And I do find that. Um, you know, this stage of aging, um, I'm, I'm noticing your phrase about post-grad work, like I'm discovering new ways in which I, I'm being invited to slow down in a holy way, I think. I think for some of us and probably for all of us who have been pretty intentional on our spiritual journey, I think that's going to take the rest of our lives to finish our postgraduate work. <laughs> I think you're right. Well, I was really intrigued um, by some of your comments about a line in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, where he says, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. Uh, that idea of a kind of outward aging or he uses the language wasting away. It's a rather strong phrase. Looking older. <laughs> Looking older. Okay. But that sense that even as that's happening, there's this inward renewal that could be happening day by day. What's that look like for you? What are you, how do you envision that um, happening for us? That is such an encouraging verse to me. Um, the message says not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Um, mm. And again, I, I'm making some comparisons in my own life between what I'm experiencing now and what I experienced 20 years ago. And I think 20 years ago, I would have said that God's grace is renewing me so I can get more done and so I can serve him better and I can be more effective, be more successful. Yeah. And that is not working anymore because, mm. um, you know, I do, I see the fruits of the spirit in my life and I'm thankful for that, but I can't just suck it up and work harder. Um, yeah. It just doesn't work. And so God's grace to me now is um, much more a sense of, you know, that's okay if it doesn't work. Yeah. It's, it's a good day. 
a um, couple of days, I don't remember when it was, a couple of days earlier this week, I just felt like I, I really flunked a relationship because I was too tired. Oh. And I was amazed to find that I felt sad about it, but I knew I'd done my best. Mm. And even if I hadn't done my best, it would be okay with God. So it's a, it's a different level of grace that is it's renewing my spirit. Um, maybe I could even say renewing my spirit rather than my body. Not that, I mean, that they're so, they're so connected. So yeah. I can't really make the distinction, but God's grace is renewing my spirit these days more than I ever knew could happen. Oh, that's encouraging. I, you know, it makes me think of interactions I've had with, you know, men and women who are 70 something, 80 something, but have a beautifully childlike spirit. There's the, there's a joyfulness, there's a, um, a spontaneity. So it just strikes me that there's this opportunity to sort of grow younger as we grow older, perhaps in, in a way. Right. In, in the book, there's one section in the book that was actually complicated for me to write. It was the beginning. I love images. And so, you know, the mm. book, um, people who don't like images will think the book is all images. <laughs> but oh, for I, me, I, it, um, I started with the, the when Jesus um, changed water into wine and the steward said, well, why did you um, save the best wine for last? And and I, to me, that was an image that mm. perhaps in us, God is saving the best for last. And so then I started playing with the idea of how long it takes for wine to ferment. And so, you know, the, the wine in our souls, God is saving the best for last. But then I got into wine skins where Jesus said, don't pour old wine. I don't think he meant good old wine, bad old wine into new wine skins because they were into old wine. Don't pour mm. new wine. This is why it got complicated. Don't <laughs> pour new wine into old wine skins. And so I thought, what are these wine skins mm. about in our spiritual journey? And I started thinking about really our souls are contained in wine skins, the wine that God is making in us. Mm. And when we pour, um, old wine into new wine skins. It, well, okay, now I'm getting confused about, this is what happened when I was writing it. I had to keep going over and over. This is a difficult image. But yes, I, I get think it. as we get older, God creates new wine skins. He, he ferments us, but he creates new wine skins. And mm. the new wine skins are ones that, it, they're wine skins that aren't quite as rule-based and ah. as transactional. Like, that's a big difference. My new wine skin is transformational and oh. my old wine skin was transactional. So wow. if I please, if I, if I obey God, he will be pleased with me. And now God has to make the new wine skin and that's very transformational. So we become different people. Yeah. And that's probably what you're sensing as you bump into somebody who has new wine skins. Yeah. I appreciate that those contrasting words, transactional and, and transformational, this sort of, I, I can identify seasons where it felt like, I, I hate to say that I was envisioning God as sort of the vending machine into which I placed my coin and expected right. a certain outcome. But there were times when that's what it was like. Whereas now the sense that God is at work, God is doing new things, even as I age, and that those new things maybe more relational. They may be more just very presence oriented rather than getting a, a list of things done oriented. Um, I was thinking that, you know, one of the things you and I share in common is that we serve others as spiritual directors. You've been doing that for a while. I'm curious about how your work of spiritual direction has changed over time as you've aged and as you've been involved longer in that work. Well, it probably has to do with age, but it also has to do with experience and figuring out what doesn't work very well. No. Yes. <laughs> so, um, and also, I'm meeting with more and more people who are older, mm. and I find I don't talk as much. Um, this podcast would not be an example. <laughs> but, ah, I understand. Um, this uh, isn't spiritual direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I've become more and more convinced 
that the people I meet with already on some level already know the answer to the questions and the issues that they're raising. And their answers will probably be worded a little bit differently than I would in my own life, and they will be nuanced differently. But I don't want to interrupt their conversation with themselves and with the spirit within. So I try, I try not to talk as much. Um, mm. That said, I also know that the younger people are in their faith and the younger people are in life, probably the more interactive I am. Sure. Um, I'm more apt to say things like, well, talk a little more about that. Yeah. Um, and when I, when I, I, sometimes I will apologize and I'll say, okay, I'm going to do a little bunny trail here and let's see what happens. <laughs> but I, I want them to be the authority. Yeah. On their life and their pain and their joy. Oh, it sounds, it sounds to me like part of, part of your journey has been just coming to trust, you know, that process, trust that God indeed is at work. Of course he's at work right. in the life of those with whom we meet. And, and of course uh, God would want very much to help them learn how to discern that relationship and gain that skill. And your presence as a kind of John the Baptist like person pointing the way, you know, uh, can help a great deal. Just the other day, I was talking with a woman who had very, very significant pain and problems in several, I mean, several very important relationships in her life. And they, it was the mm. perfect storm. They were all happening at once. And sometimes when I'm in spiritual direction, I have this sense of, oh, I am really out of my league here. <laughs> that would be, oh, yes. I was that day. And, you know, I just thought, I, I can't, we can't problem solve here. I mean, I said to her, you know, I said, this is, these are not problems to be solved. And all we can do is be present to God who is present to us. And somehow, I, I don't know how it came, but somehow out of that, the quiet and the, um, the quiet interaction we were having, we ended up with scripture. And I do find, I mean, that's a place where I feel more secure. I mean, it's not saying, well, you know, the Bible says you love you, what's your problem? It's right. not like that. It's when scripture really speaks like it did to me the day I read that, you know, all is lost, but then you find the kingdom of God. I mean, that spoke to me. And when scripture yes. comes alive, we can tell in our own lives and in spiritual direction. And that's always a wonderful experience. It really is when scripture is, is wisdom, you know, that yes. speaks to life and, and not just a, a proof text or a, something to quote that's, you know, religiously appropriate or, or yes. whatever. Um, well, I've really enjoyed talking about uh, your book. I, I raised some questions. I wonder if there's anything else about the book I didn't think to ask that you'd like to say before we close our conversation. One of the words that I use in the book that um, I guess is becoming more popular, but is liminal space. I love yeah, that word. That's a we great live word. in liminal space and liminal space is the space between where we are now and where we are going. And of course, the Israelites were in geographical liminal space as they left Egypt. And they even said, it would have been better if we died in Egypt. And I think on a really bad day, I think, well, it would have been better if I died young, but it's liminal space and God is taking us to a new land. Mm. Um, and one of the images that I love as I think about this is it's in this, I think it's Genesis one, two, the Holy spirit was hovering over the darkness and the chaos. Mm. And so that I, that's a that's a promise that I hang on to. The Holy Spirit is hovering over us every day that we get older and every year, every decade. It keeps changing. Um, so that's a, a great comfort. Yeah, that really is. Well, I wonder if as we close, if you would be willing sort of as a spiritual director, maybe to speak a word of encouragement to our listeners. You know, some of them are aging. Maybe they're 60 something, 70 something. Many of the listeners may be a bit younger, and maybe they're not thinking very much yet about issues of aging, though 
it's still a reality that all of us are on a journey for. So just maybe a word of encouragement you could share with our listeners. I will. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> this is a verse that, well, it's actually, if I may, it's a couple of verses Please. from the message. Yeah. So it's, in some ways, it's a little bit longer than I might, like if, if I were with somebody, but it's a verse that I come back to again and again when I offer spiritual direction. And I have to say, I never read this passage without being drawn to something that comforts me. So mm. this is, again, from the message, which is a translation that I find often jump starts me into sure. a new way of thinking. And it's from Matthew 6, um, familiar passage. I think it's about the treasures. I don't know. I've read this so much, I can't remember. So it's the end of Matthew 6. And Jesus said to the disciples, what I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Mm. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, I, that's, that just touches my heart. <laughs> well, Every thank time. you. That it, it's it's a good way to close our conversation. And again, today our guest has been Alice Freiling, and we've been talking about her book Aging Faithfully. Alice has been a real pleasure to have this conversation today. Thank you, Alan. It's been good to be with you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. I know that some of you may be in your fifties, sixties, or older, and these themes may feel especially helpful. Others of you may be in your 20s, 30s, or 40s, and these ideas may feel a little ways off for you. I've found it interesting that when I visited monasteries, they have a practice of remembering our death. It's something that, be, that we awaken to more and more as we age. Now, the Latin for that is memento mori. So, for example, in their closing communal prayer of the day, they pray something like, May the all-powerful Lord grant us a restful night and a peaceful death. All the monks, whether they are brand new novices or seasoned elders in the community, join in this prayer. A peaceful death. Uh, this isn't being morbid, but rather it's an opportunity to remember the reality of our limited lifespan. We will live forever through trusting Christ but this human life in these physical bodies is limited. And that's a wise thing to recall with grace and humility. Now, in this new season and in the next few episodes, we'll be talking with authors Felicia Wu Song, Michael McKenzie, and Mark Scandrett. We'll also have conversations with leaders like you on topics like practicing silence in a noisy world and being transformed for the sake of others. I can't wait to share those with you. Now, if you'd like to receive more help from Unhurried Living, I invite you to join our Unhurried Daily email list. For 40 days, we'll send you a brief daily email that offers personal reflections from life in Scripture to help you take the next step in following Jesus' unhurried way. You can sign up on our website at unhurriedliving.com. We're honored to encourage thousands of leaders just like you. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to the Unhurried Living Podcast. Join me next time to learn more about following the genius of Jesus' unhurried way of life and leadership.